You know, I didn't really think it was possible for there to be more Twitter files, uh, yet there are. And in this video, I'm going to give you a short breakdown of the latest Twitter files release. Keep in mind, we have seen everything from the FBI actively censoring satire on election day via Twitter to the FBI paying Twitter over three and a half million dollars in reimbursements for Twitter's efforts to help censor things the FBI wanted censored or visibility filtered. Fancy way of saying shadow banning. We have also seen from within Twitter an effort to hide stories that were about true discoveries like the Hunter Biden laptop, all under the direction of politicians. And the more donations that were funneled to politicians from individuals within Twitter, the more connections were built between politicians and employees within Twitter, and the tighter those connections were, the more censorship was possible. Today, things go a little bit further, and that's what we're going to reveal in today's Twitter files, where I've picked out the most salient pieces of the latest Twitter files drop such as the following, where the Trump White House allegedly sought to combat misinformation about, quote, runs on grocery stores, which is a way of saying grocery stores might run out of a product if people continue to stock up the way they were during the uh, beginning of the COVID pandemic, which you might remember, we did have runs on grocery stores. We ran out of toilet paper, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic. And here you can see the Trump White House called for help from tech companies to combat misinformation, including runs on grocery stores. So this isn't only Democrats who were looking to censor things that were inconvenient to their administration, but it was also the Trump campaign, though Trump specifically in this Twitter files ends up being targeted by the FBI. Now, we also see here, it's not just Twitter that was involved in this. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and other big tech companies were involved as well. And a lot of these were, were conspiracies as of just really, uh, you know, a few months ago. Uh, all the big tech collusion and censorship campaigns were deemed to be conspiracies and sort of right-wing fringe theories. And uh, Elon Musk said it well just a few days ago when on the All In podcast he says, you know, it's interesting that almost every single one of the conspiracy theories about Twitter turned out to be true. And this just gives us some example here where, for example, we see when the Biden administration took over, one of their first meeting requests with Twitter executives was on COVID. And the focus was on anti-vaxxer accounts. Right here, as you could say, per regular process, public policy took the meeting. Biden staff focused on vaccine and high profile anti-vaxxer accounts, including Alex Berenson. Now that's interesting here, especially since you can see that Berenson sued Twitter and eventually settled with Twitter. And as a result of that lawsuit, documents came out showing things like Twitter messages through Slack. Hey, how was the White House meeting? Overall, pretty good. They had one really tough question about why Alex Berenson hadn't been kicked off the platform. Otherwise, their questions were pointed but fair. So interesting, you can kind of see some of the, the tenseness between uh, a Twitter almost trying to say like, hey, hey, like, this is going a little bit too far and the pressures of the White House, uh, which you would think should stand for free speech, but instead is actually actively trying to limit free speech. In fact, you could see, he, see here that the Biden team was not satisfied with Twitter's enforcement approach as they wanted Twitter to do more and to de-platform several accounts. You know, it's interesting that free speech today has uh, turned into uh, something that's, that's uh, very, very vilifying and that I think everybody agrees we should have free speech. Uh, but uh, you know, if somebody interviews somebody or allows somebody to speak that someone else disagree with, or disagrees with, all of a sudden it's called platforming. And if you platform somebody with an opinion that you don't like, well then maybe that person should be deplatformed. And it's it's so such an interesting like duality. So le let's clarify that thought for a moment. How on one hand can we say, oh, we want free speech, but then criticize people for platforming people with another opinion. 
You know, this is basically to say people should be able to share their opinion in interviews, on podcasts, on Twitter, or whatever. They shouldn't be deplatformed if we are to stand for free speech. But the same thing actually happens pretty commonly, especially on YouTube. For example, I've had some controversial figures that I've interviewed on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'll give an example. Somebody who is, according to Wikipedia, deemed to be a right-wing extremist and a white supremacist. The person individually disagrees with both of these characteristics, but I've personally interviewed somebody like Lauren Southern on this YouTube channel. And I had a, you know, I, I basically had an unbiased interview with them. You could look it up yourself and wanted to hear their side of the story. But I was actually personally berated for platforming such a person, which is so ironic because on one hand, we all agree on free speech, but then if we platform somebody, that's bad. The same thing really extends here to Twitter, right? If we are to truly stand for free speech, then we should be okay with people being platformed, right? People having the opportunity to speak, to stand up in the public square uh, and speak, as long as obviously they're not breaking the law, right? But I do think it's remarkable how much pressure, uh, and, and I can imagine that pressure being very great coming from the White House, especially like that's supposed to be an institution that at least as children were taught like, this is, that's like the big leagues. That's the top of the country, right? It's, that's the symbol of America and freedom. When the reality is, in practice, it's actually now become the symbol of oppression and censorship and deplatforming. It's really disgusting. Like, it turns what we, what we learned as children on its head. I'm really sad. Twitter executives did not fully capitulate to the Biden team wishes. An extensive review of internal communications at the company revealed employees often debated moderation cases in great detail and with more care than was shown by the government towards free speech. This is actually a defense of Twitter here, showing that Twitter was working harder to preserve free speech than our very own government. But Twitter did ultimately suppress views from many doctors and scientific experts that conflicted with the official positions of uh, the White House. As a result, legitimate findings and questions that would have expanded the public debate went missing. And this is bad because when you remove sort of one person's potential criticism, uh, that, then you re remove potential further review of, of studies, right? Keep in mind that most studies end with a paragraph and it's sort of like a catch-all liability release. But they end with a paragraph that generally says, hey, this is the result that we achieved in our study, but we recommend further studies, right? So on one hand, you have people who conduct studies saying, hey, we want more studies. But then if people reply to, let's say, a study and are like, hey, like, what about this? This deserves some more, you know, looking into, basically. If that, hey, this deserves some more looking into is censored, then we actually destroy the scientific process really, really scary. And it's sad because I hate to say it, but the politicians uh, have been more, the, the politicians who have been most vocal about doing what science encourages, uh, frankly, more of those from the Biden admin and, and on the left, uh, have been more active at actually destroying the scientific method by censoring. That's scary. And we'll go through some examples in just a moment. So there were, and then they, uh, you know, they talk a little bit about here, the reliance on bots and, and contractors in the Philippines for moderation, how this was a problem. Uh, I, I could see that, you know, certainly language barriers potentially. But then they give some examples here. Here's a Harvard Medical School doctor, an epidemiologist, who, who you think should have, you know, uh, the right to speak. Uh, saying here that thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking that nobody should. COVID vaccines are important for older high-risk people and their caretakers. Those with prior natural infection do not need it, nor children. This is actually now, right, seems like a very reasonable statement. Yet what ended up happening? Well, what ended up happening is look at this email, internal email, heads up. Sending a heads up that we will take action on this tweet for violating our COVID misinformation policy, specifically by sharing false information in regards to the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines, which goes against CDC guidelines. That's insane. So that person's tweet ended up getting flagged. And listen to this. This tweet cannot be replied to, shared, 
or liked. I mean, if you can't share it or like it or comment on it, you have destroyed the scientific process. You prevent the idea from spreading to other individuals for more dialogue, and you prevent dialogue at all. It's shocking. On the other hand, you've got somebody here who's a self-proclaimed uh, public health fact checker uh, who argues that, hey, you know, why are we allowing something like this to stand without censorship. This stat here or this this uh, tweet here says, here's some data. Since December of 2021, COVID has been the leading cause of death from disease in children. And this person replies, this is cherry picking. This is only like COVID is only the leading cause of death if you ignore all non-disease deaths, accidents, right? And you ignore cancer, heart disease, SIDS. And then all of a sudden COVID is the leading, leading cause of death. And they actually provide statistics. Now we should be able to analyze those st statistics and say, hey, are these are these correct? Like, is Kelly correct? Or is the other tweet person, you know, a person tweeting correct? But we can't because Twitter then steps in and censors that and doesn't allow replies or shares or uh, or likes. Here's another one where some, uh, an account called Infectious Disease Ethics plotted the rise in cases of cardiac arrests and myocarditis in 16 to 39 year olds, AKA younger people. And they plot the rise of COVID cases here. And then the rise in incidence of uh, cardiac arrests and myocarditis. And, and they make the argument that there are some correlations between the vaccine and cardiac arrests and myocarditis. And this is a very concerning chart. There's a very reasonable uh, uh, linkage uh, to myocarditis and, and uh, the COVID vaccine. In fact, this is why uh, there, there's a, look, I'm, I'm not a nurse, but there is, there's this idea that when you provide a shot, you're supposed to, I believe it's called aerate the shot by, uh, by basically pulling back on the plunger a little bit to see if there's any blood going into the uh, syringe. And if there is blood in the syringe, the, the uh, needle should be removed, I believe discarded, and a new one should be attempted and it should be checked again. Did you hit a blood vessel? Uh, and the reason for this is if, if you get blood in and then you inject the vaccine, that vaccine then can fa fast track basically to the heart muscle and uh, the, the compounds in that vaccine at higher doses could cause problems for the heart muscle. So there's like actually a, like, application issue here that could actually be leading to the rise of these, these problems. So there's some legitimacy to this, uh, potentially a lot of legitimacy to this. And this is something that should be shared and talked about, right? Uh, now, I don't think anybody should say like with certainty, one thing is right, one thing is wrong, but that's literally what Twitter was doing by labeling stuff as misleading. And then again, can't even reply to it. Like if I'm like, hey, this is correct because of this, or I think this is wrong because of this, I couldn't even reply to it because Twitter said, you're not allowed to talk about that. That's messed up. It's messed up. And there are more and more examples of censorship and, and reviewals of how like strikes were, were implemented but shouldn't have been. Uh, again, more examples. Here's one. This was probably the most damning one. Uh, and no, it's not that the coupon code expires today on flying with me in a private jet uh, as we shadow each other or you shadow me to learn about real estate or the coupon for the educational programs on building your wealth. Those options are linked down below. But instead, it is that Donald Trump here mentions that you should not be afraid of COVID, which is actually, you know, an optimistic thing, right? It's it's providing hope for people. It's, it's you know, uh, it's, it's not saying that you shouldn't be careful. It's just saying, look, don't let it dominate your life. You know, I, I think this is, a, this is in a dark time, a fair thing to say uh, to some extent. You know, some people are going to go, I don't know, does that make people be less cautious? Well, let that be a debate, right? But Jim Baker, who used to work at the FBI right before the election here, does not think there should be a debate. Jim Baker says... Why isn't this president of the United States tweet a violation of our COVID-19 policy, especially don't be afraid of COVID statement? Come on, man. There was actually a reply to this. In short, this tweet is a broad, optimistic statement. It doesn't incite people to do something harmful, nor does it recommend against taking precautions or following medical directives. It doesn't fall within the published scope of our policies. 
curious, uh, curious whether you have a different read on it, though. It's like, here's a former FBI guy. We must censor the president. This is scary. You know? Uh, and uh, there's even evidence here that Twitter did prioritize the review and labeling of content that could lead to increased exposure of transmission uh, of, of the virus. It's just, it's really incredible. It's really, really sad. Uh, and it's so good that this is now coming to light. As they say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And boy, oh boy, has there been some disinfecting to do. Now you just wonder what's going on at Facebook and, uh, you know, some other platforms. But, uh... Knock on wood. I haven't had one of my videos censored since January 5th when I covered Donald Trump's speech right before the January 6th um, capital disaster. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. Good luck out there.